to invite you all and thank you all for coming. My name is Kayla and I will be your host today. I not only work for the library, but I also have my own nonprofit called Homegrown North Carolina and we assisted in putting on these events as well. So we just want to welcome you also. Um, without further ado, we're gonna have Mr. Houston Sinal come up and present about Montfort Point Marine. He is the director of the National, National Monument here, and he will give us a wealth of information on the Montfort Point Marine. Let's clap for Mr. Strong. Thank you, Kay. The part that she forgot to mention was, I'm an uncle. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and take an opportunity to share with you the little bit that I know about the history of the Montfort Point Marine. If you can imagine, uh, a time just 80 years ago, if you will, uh, there were no blacks in the Marine Corps. This year marks the 80th anniversary of the Moffat Point Marines. Uh, from 1942, when the executive order was signed, to this year, makes 80 years. So we'll be doing a number of grand celebrations of the 20,000 African Americans that went through Moffat Point camp to become Marines. We estimate that there's probably only 200 of those gentlemen still living today. Uh, having said that, uh, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a couple phone numbers. And before this month is over, if you will, make a point to call that number. The individual that will answer the phone on the other end will be one of your local Moffat Point Marines, Mr. John Spencer and Mr. Hooper, who is down in Wilmington. Uh, Mr. Spencer was going to be with me here today, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. So I've done what they do with the big programs. I've got him on video. Uh, so he'll be able to, to speak to you all before we finish up. From 1942 to 1949, African Americans trained in Moffat Point Camp. We, got, we gave them the title Moffat Point Marine only if you went to boot camp at Moffat Point. Moffat Point was Marine Corps' third boot camp. So for those active duty Marines, or those individuals that have been in the Marine Corps, if you ask the question, how many boot camps has the Marine Corps had, they'll tell you two. San Diego and California. You're either East Coast Marine or you're West Coast Marine. Well, the truth of the matter is, Montfort Point Camp was actually a recruit depot for African Americans. So if you were a recruit at that camp, then we lovingly give you the title of Montfort Point Marine. Uh, when the Congressional Gold Medal was issued to the Montfort Point Marines for the service, that their service, in terms of helping with desegregation, it covered those individuals that went to boot camp at Montfort Point. Montfort Point was a training camp then. It remains a training camp to this day. Marines still go through training at Montfort Point, which is now called Camp Johnson. So in theory, the Marines that train there now, we consider them modern day Montfort Pointers. But to carry the official title, you had to have been a recruit out there. President, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8802, 1941, authorizing blacks to enter the Marine Corps. Now, when you read the executive order, it didn't say we now authorize blacks to enter the Marine Corps. It was the Fair Employment Act. Okay, at that time, war was going on, there was discrimination in employment, and a lot of industries that were doing the work for the, mili for the military. And he said, okay, you can't discriminate in DOD. Well, Unfortunately, the Marine Corps was the last service to desegregate, and they were still not accepting blacks. So they had to take their banner down. Once they took their banner down, uh, African Americans opted to join the Marine Corps. Again, and it hasn't changed much. A lot of those individuals were given an option between the Army, because they could, at the time, they could go into the Army, they could go into the Navy, but everybody wants to be a Marine, right? Don't answer that. Don't answer that. <laughs> Since I know I'm not the only Marine in the house. Uh, so, again, this opened up the opportunity for African Americans to join the Marine Corps. And roughly 20,000 of them came through. Now, when they set up the boot camp for the African Americans, the notion was, the genuine belief was, that African Americans could not be Marines. We did not have what it took to be a Marine. So, this was a test. This was actually an opportunity for 
society, if you will, to prove that blacks didn't have what it took to be a Marine. And here I am. So what does that tell you? Uh, you hear a lot of them talk about the training they received and that it was tough. And it says some cases, Sergeant Major Huff talked about it. Uh, they pushed him and told him, gave him the opportunity. You could go home. Now imagine those of us that went through the military. Did you ever see an opportunity where if you just decided you didn't like it, you go home? <laughs> didn't happen. But that was, that was the mentality that was going on. So the drill instructors, well, let's go back up. They chose Marco Point here in South Carolina for a reason. It wasn't just an out-of-the-way place that they picked. They picked Marco Point because it was in the South. They picked Marco Point because it was in the South because those in the individuals in the South had a lot more experience at dealing with blacks than other areas. So they sent the boot camp where the people would be the most comfortable and supposedly everybody could get along. So they showed up at Marco Point. When they got to Marco Point, to their surprise, and heard Mr. Hooper tell them this week because he's on interview, uh, they came to go to boot camp. Well, since there had been no blacks in the Marine Corps, guess what there was not at Marco Point when they got here? A boot camp. So the first group of Marines to arrive at Marco Point whether you were a truck driver, a cook, a baker, a candlestick maker, that was what you did initially to help build the camp to go to boot camp. You know, so they not only went to boot camp after they finished building the camp, but they were actually part of the element that helped construct the camp. Camp Lejeune was actually being constructed right about that same time. So there was a lot of construction going on in this particular area of North Carolina. Now, once they completed the camp, and they began their boot camp training. All of the drill instructors that trained the recruits at Michael Point were white, obviously, right? If these were the first black recruits, then there were no white drill instructors, black drill instructors. <clears throat> but now, one of the things that the commandant thought was if we, and that wasn't the commandant, take that back. One of the thoughts was if we can quickly train some blacks to train the black recruits, then maybe we can ease up some of the pressure because the white drill instructors were driving them. I mean, driving them hard. Like I said, they, the belief was if I push you hard enough, you'll quit. So they worked real hard to get some black drill instructors. Sergeant Major Huff, and a lot of you may know these names. Uh, Sergeant Major Huff, who was a resident here in Jackson, Onsville County. Uh, Sergeant Major Johnson. Johnson was Huff's brother-in-law, if you didn't know, and they were married to two sisters who came out of Kenston, North Carolina. So, they established that the blacks were trained the black recruits, so they picked the elite of the blacks and trained them to be drill instructors. And what the Marines found after they got black drill instructors was that the training didn't get easier. It got harder. But it got harder for a different reason. The first individual made it hard on you, hoping you'd quit. The second individual made it hard on you so that you couldn't fail. So the black drill instructor's mentality was failure was not an option. We were already sitting here with the expectation that we would fail, and we won't. So those drill instructors tended to push the recruits even harder than the white drill instructors. Ultimately, and Sergeant Major Huff said it, and said, ultimately they had no one to leave. He did tell a story about one night some guys were packing their bags to leave, and I saw him say he stood at the door, and they talked about him. He was as big as they came, and as wild as they are, and he said he stood at the door with his knife in his hand, and said, nobody leave unless you pass me. And nobody left. <laughs> so uh, there was a lot going on with them, but the training that they received at Marco Point was the same training as the Marines. Now, the white drill instructors may not have wanted them to be in the Marine Corps, but the fact was that they were there so the training that they received was Marine Corps recruit training. There were no corners cut in that area because if they were going to be Marines, then they had to have the skills, the ability, and the knowledge as any Marine. So they ensured that the training they received was that. Now, they have always got the hand-me-downs for their training. Uh, they didn't get the new gun off the truck. They got the gun that you had to repair before you could shoot it, that type of thing. But they made it anyway. In fact, they talk about the first two units that they stood up. The first unit was the 51st Defense Battalion, which
which was an anti-aircraft gun van. Uh, and if you ever been out to the memorial, the M1A1 gun you see there is the same gun that the Mop Point Marines trained on. They would tell the stories of when they trained with that gun, they got proficient enough on that gun that when they go out to shoot target practice, and the way they did their target practice was a plane would fly along dragging a stream of the target. And their job was to shoot the target, to hit the target. They tell the story when days they didn't feel like training, they shoot the cable that was holding the flag. <laughs> and then the plane would have to go back to get a new one. And on most days, they decide that that was a waste of time, so they secure training for the day. So they didn't have to go back and finish. And I don't doubt that. They, they reportedly broke every training record that was established at Camp Lejeune for firing these weapons. The sad part of that story is the Mopa Point Marines were never called into combat. It's like you have Michael Jordan on your team and leave him on the bench. So that part of the history, you know, you, you have to wonder, had we put the A team in, how many other Marines, whether they were black or white, might have come back from the war. But that was the sign of the time. Now, when we teach this story at Camp Johnson, or when you talk to mob appointments, they will tell you there were a lot of things that took place that were hard, were difficult, wasn't necessarily right, nowhere near fair. But they will tell you, don't focus on those things. Focus on the success that they had as Marines. They said they couldn't make it through boot camp, they did. They said they wouldn't make it in the court, and they did. And a lot of the individuals that trained at Mopper Point went on from Mopper Point from uh, World War II on to Korea, and some of you stayed around in Vietnam. When they came here to Jacksonville, Jacksonville was not a hug me town for the Black Marine. Okay? Uh, but believe it or not, a whole bunch of them stayed in Jacksonville got out of the Marine Corps, and stayed right here. And to that uh, degree, and one of the original mob appointments, and some of you may know his name, Turner G. Blunt, went on to be a city councilman in the city of Jacksonville. So somewhere deep down inside, Jacksonville had this good heart. Uh, and as time went on, uh, it became clear the history of the mob Point Marine is much of a part of the history of Jacksonville as any other history you you set off to learn these days, which is a good thing for all of us as a group. Now, what I want to do is, I have a video that I'm going to share with you. It's about seven minutes long. Uh, it was done by the 35th Colonel Marine Corps and his Sergeant Major. General Amos was the first Sergeant Major to really push to establish that the Mapa Point history was a part of Marine Corps history and a part of American history and challenged every Marine from private to general, to know that story. Then once we get through with that, I'm going to come back answering the questions. And when we finish, I'll leave you with the comments from uh, the original mock appointment. And there's your story better than I could have said it myself. Uh, and again, the thing that the Mopa Point Marines would have you know from their chapter in history is it doesn't matter how tough the struggle is, it's all about your commitment to see it through. Your success nine times out of ten will depend on how much you put in. Now there will, there will be situations and times and things as they demonstrated that may hold you back, uh, but more times than not, we quit as opposed to the one more push that may have gotten us over the top. So again, their story is a story of success. Uh, there were hardships involved, but they overcame them. And again, I mentioned earlier about the Mopa Point Marines receiving the Congressional Gold Medal. They received the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest civilian award you can receive from the United States. And they received that for the part that they played in helping to desegregate the Marine Corps. Because they had a choice to make. Once they got to Marple Point, they could very easily have chose to tear up Jacksonville, 
They could very easily have chosen to do everything but what the Marine Corps expected of them. They could very easily have chosen to prove that people were right, that they couldn't be Marines. But instead, they chose to comply, they chose to endure, and they chose to hang in there until success came out at the end. And the thing about that for us here is it all took place in our hometown. Uh, one of the things that I, I learned in working with the Tourism Development Department as we were building Moss Point Memorial was tourism is not about what you have. And you all know we have some nice beaches. We have a lot of things in Jacksonville. Tourism was about what you have that nobody else has. And we here in Jacksonville and Lonsdale County can say we have the only Marine Corps boot camp for African Americans known as Moffa Point Camp right here in Jacksonville. And that gives us something as a community to be very proud of. Okay, now, I mentioned Mr. Spencer. You and I know the positive up when we do these events. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, he's right now under the weather, so he couldn't be here. So I'm gonna share with you, I'll let him share with you his opinion on what it meant to be a Moffa Point Marine. My full name is John Lee Spencer. I was sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. Why am I proud to be a Marine? Do you want to talk all day long? <laughs> Just a little. I'm proud to be a Marine because when I came in the Marine Corps, they said we weren't capable of being a Marine. We didn't send for you. We didn't need you because we didn't send for you. Now you can get on the bus and go back home. But we didn't do that. We stepped up out, out of the bus to prove to the world that everybody in the United States was, one was just as good as the other, if given a chance. Well, at that particular time, we weren't really caring if we was a Marshall Point Marine or not. We just wanted to be a United States Marine and we wanted to make sure that the people knew that we, are, we were capable of being just as good or better as anybody else. That memorial there, it means a lot to me because I was one of the first black Marines to go into combat with these two second and third ammo companies. We were the first to go and that monument means a lot to us. But yeah, I didn't do nothing extraordinary because it, we was a group that was supposed to do a, do a job. If we did it well, we come out with medals. If we did it wrong, we came out with a corpse. So I'm glad to be that we did it right and I came out living. That's, that's where it all began right there, from an ammo box to a rifle. <laughs> that's, that's the way it was. We had done been dedicated as United States Marines, not a black Marine or a white Marine. We were a United States Marine, so that therefore that put us above color. It made us just one with our country. That's what made it so make us feel so good. We were one with our country. That's what we need right now. It's togetherness. We need to come together like we did after Pearl Harbor. All for one and one for all.
Okay, have you ever traveled up Highway 17 between Jacksonville and say the overpass? Over on, I'm sorry, 24. Highway 24. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you if you're on 24 going downtown, uh, the the June Memorial Gardens, you know what that is on the right there. Well, Mop Point is down past the monument. Mop Landing Road is at the traffic light. It's where you turn. The uh, Veterans Cemetery, the memorial, and the road between them will take you to Marble Point Center. Uh, Why did they select that area to have the uh, recount? Uh, because, again, it was part of the, the camp being built. All of the June was being built at the time. And they, because they were training and the Marine was doing amphibious things, the whole of June came about. And that particular spot seemed to provide the training area that they needed for these Marines. They were, they were able to give them the training they needed and then keep them separate from the rest of the world while they did that. Okay. But all the other Marines were still being trained. trained Paris Island and San Diego. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and then when they closed down the recruit training at Mopa Point in 1949, then all Marines went to San Diego and Paris Island, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, regardless of rank. Yes, sir. Why did they close down Mopa? Why did they distribute them to these other two places? Uh, because of the signing of an executive order that ended segregation, which said you could no longer separate them. Uh, so at that point, they closed down that camp, and you know all of us went to the same boot camp. <coughs> and all these things were done via executive order. Anybody else? How long is boot camp not yet? Uh, 13 weeks. Uh, and I guess they could teach it. In fact, when I went through boot camp, it was 13 weeks. And then at some point, they shortened it. Uh, I think it got down as low as nine weeks at one time uh, for recruit training, yeah. But it was a 13-week evolution. Now, uh, part of the, the title that goes with this series is Traveling in Black Duansville County. Uh, I only have a couple of things that I want to point out to you in reference to the pointers that tie back to that title. From the Moffa Pointers, when they went to boot camp at Moffa Point, they were not allowed to travel through Jacksonville with rifles when they went to the rifle range. As a result of that, they actually loaded them on boats at Moffa Point, ferried them down the river to get to the rifle range. So you had to be on the rifle range at daybreak, which means they had to get them up before daybreak for the normal time in order to get them on the boats down the river then the fried rifle range, then they had to come back up the river the same way <coughs> uh, to get back to their camp. And again, as they pointed out, everybody qualified. So it's just a matter of what, of what you commit yourself to. Second point is, during the time, during that time, if you were an African American Marine at Marble Point, regardless of your rank, if you could not be in charge of a white man, there was a white private there, and you were a gunner sergeant. For those of you that know rank, he was in charge. And last but not least, if you were an African American Marine, you could not go to the main side of June unless you were escorted by a white man. So there were some of those obstacles that went on. They overcame them. Okay? And, and I say that to say this. No matter what the obstacle, if you hang in there, and sometimes you can fight your way and not get there or hold your peace and you'll discover on the end you come out on the higher side. Okay, uh, that is my presentation. If I have no other questions, uh, we appreciate you coming out. And I said I was going to share something with those of you that have something to write with. Uh, two numbers. Mr. Spencer's phone number is 910-9-1-1. Five eight one three. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Spencer, John Spencer, is three five eight five eight one three. Three five eight five eight one three. Five eight nine one zero. Yes, sir. Five eight one three.
okay? And Mr. Hooper is now one zero five two zero eight one eight four. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we finished building the memorial in 2016. Uh, we started that project in 2009. Uh, actually, it started 10 years before that uh, with a $20,000 donation from Boeing Aircraft Company. Uh, but we actually literally kicked the memorial into gear in 2009, and we finished in 2016. Uh, and that was one of those projects. Uh, it started out that. If you've been by there, it started out as a project that was going to be on the base. It was going to be on the base across the street from the museum. And once we got going with the, with the monument plan, the nephew of an original Marshal Pointer offered to help us do the design work. Uh, well, let me back up before that. The original monument plan, which was going to be on Camp Johnson, uh, was a small monument, and we were going to do a a wall, and that wall was going to have a bus on it, and there was going to be a <coughs> image of Sergeant Major Johnson, Sergeant Major Huff, and Frederick Branch, all the ones that you heard mentioned in the video. Uh, again, Huff was the first uh, sorry, black Sergeant Major, uh, Johnson was the first command Sergeant Major, and Branch was the first officer. Uh, and we put that design together, and we sat on it for about 10 years. And then finally, the original, when we went back to a convention to vote on moving forward with it, the original Marshall Pointers finally told the truth. And their complaint was, if you build it like that, it won't be reflective of all of us. It will represent those three individuals you put on the wall. So we went back to the drawing board. <coughs> with that being said, we went back to the drawing board and Again, we have a nephew of original Marshal Pointer who was willing to help us try to put the design pieces together. And what you see out there, if you've ever been, that is the lesser of the three designs that he put together. Uh, and we started out working on that one. It was estimated to be $1.2 million. Uh, I agreed to chair that. The building piece, as long as they got somebody else to raise the money, because I wasn't a talker and the money wasn't what I did. <laughs> but guess what I quickly learned now? You only want to talk to the guys on the ground building. You, you don't want to talk to the money guy. You want to talk to the guy that can tell you what's going on, what your plans are, and how you're moving things. So ultimately, I end up at a whole bunch of meetings like this, you know, talking money, uh, in spite of the fact that I said that, that was not my plan. <laughs> but we were. We, we managed to build it in about 13 years. Uh, and historically, project of that size is normally a 20-year project. Yeah. Uh, so we were successful in that. Uh, we are still, it, it, even though that's done, we're still working with the committee there because we're going to put a visitor center out there with bathrooms. Right now there are no bathroom facilities at any of the memorials in the garden. So we still have a project going on to make sure we put bathroom facilities out there, uh, some information, uh, Hopefully it'll be a high-tech digital center where you can go there and get information, uh, find out what's in the entire gardens, and you'll be able to, to go from there. Yes, ma'am. Well, that was that was a small number, and they all didn't show up at one time. You you got to figure yeah, it out. That was yeah. over the years from forty two to forty nine, right? right. Uh, and again, it was through the regular recruitment, Marine Corps recruiting, uh, and that one of them mentioned in the, the the video. Some of them were in the line to go in the army or the other services and got pulled and were sent over to the Marine side. <clears throat> so yeah, so uh, that was how that regular recruiting. Yes, sir. So you said regular recruiting. So did you have white? Uh, I mean, the, the, the white recruiting. Recruiting. Recruiting the, yes, sir. Recruiting the white people or both the black and the, the white. People? White recruiters recruited everybody because okay. there were no black recruiters, not the Marines. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now there may have been black recruiters for the other services, 
Uh, and in a lot of cases, like what he said, they shared recruits. If the Marine was short too, and you showed up, the Army guy may very well walk you over and hand you to the Marine so that he made his quota. Yeah. And uh, that's how it was done. But again, when they first started the recruiting, believe it or not, uh, when we tell the story of the 20,000 that showed up, you get the impression that they all showed up and were kicking the door down to get in. Not true. Uh, the Marine Corps had to do a little bit of work to get a lot of the recruits in. Only because a lot of them had no family history of members in the military. Because you know, in a lot of cases, you go in because your uncle was in the military, or you had a brother that was in, or a family member, and somebody gives you incentive. Well, a lot of the blacks did not have that incentive. So the recruits actually had to do some work, and they were tasked. They were tasked. I think the first number they had to re reach was like a thousand, and that first thousand turned out to be harder for them to get than they thought. You know, it eventually picked up until they got to the twenty thousand. Uh, but no, they they didn't show up day one, uh, kicking the door down to get in. One in the back, yes, sir. Young man, I'm looking for going in the Marine Corps. Yes, sir. What can I expect now as I go into the Marine Corps? Can I expect equal treatment? Uh, as equal as you get anywhere else in the United States. <laughs> uh, the, the, and, and, and let me say this and have to say that. Because the average Marine that's on active duty right now, if you talk to him, he would not have an idea that 80 years ago, there was no blacks in the Marine Corps. And I'm telling you, you talk to a black or a white Marine, they'll have no idea. And some people will stop and say, 80 years is a long time. Not if you ask me. Uh, not if you ask that young guy back there that asked the question. Uh, so 80 years is not a long time. So the Corps has changed to the point, not with just the, the, the African American males, but even with females in the Corps. You know? And it's real easy to once you get in, you get going, you, you take this mentality, this has always been. It just feels like it's, it has always been, you know. Uh, and unfortunately, it has not always been. And when you compare the Marine Corps to other services, 80 years of service is a drop in the bucket. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that the Monster Point Marines, they got called to combat. So what did they do? They just trained and then they got out of the Marine Corps, or okay, what, good what question, happened? Good question. Okay, they were they they were brought on board as an anti-aircraft veteran. That was one of the the main units. The other unit that was in place, they were support people. They have, which is what they primarily did. They were ammo carriers, choke, uh, sh uh, ammo carriers, stretcher bearers, cooks, bakers, candlestick makers, truck drivers. They did all the support jobs. Okay. But their primary function as a unit was to fire that big gun. Uh, and when, uh, when you hear Mr. Spencer talk about, he was in an ammo company. So he was in the first unit that went, and their job, you know, their job was to move ammo. Uh, in fact, there's one story, if you read this book called Right to Fight, there was a white Marine that talked about the fact he had gotten wounded and was patched up and was headed back to his unit and he jumped a ride with some Mock Point Marines that were moving ammo, headed back toward his unit. And it said, he said, once he got on the truck, it dawned on him just how hazardous that job was. You load a truck with ammunition, and then you take it to where ammunition is being fired. <laughs> okay? And you offload it, and then you take it down the line to the individuals that are actually firing the bullets. Okay, so he realized real quick, they had as hazardous a job as any Marine that was on the front line firing his weapon because they, they moved ammo. Not only did they move ammo out to the individuals that were fighting, but if you were wounded and couldn't get yourself out, they brought out those individuals that were wounded during the war. And the notion that the, the Mock Pointers would not be successful because that was, that, was, that was taught that they would not stay under gunfire. 
That was going to be the big test. You know, you know, baptism by gunfire. And they proved not only would they stay, but they take in the ammo and they bring out the wound. Again, success stories that we remember about this. Yes, ma'am. I have one more question. And then I'll get you set. How many Marines, um, Montfort Marines, were killed during the the World War II? Were there any? Uh, yes, and I can't tell you how many. Uh, I don't know. And I tell you why I don't know, because there are not a lot of records to validate those things. Because if you go out to the Moffat Point Memorial, you'll notice that the wall out there, Vietnam Memorial is here. It's got the name of all those individuals that died in Vietnam. You go down to Beirut Memorial, you'll notice that the Beirut Memorial has the names of all those individuals that died in the bombing. And you get to Moffat Point, and you notice there are no names. There are stars. And we went with stars simply because we did not have a complete record of the 20,000 Marines that trained in Moffat Point. Uh, and that's for a lot of different reasons. Again, like I told you in the beginning, when they first started out, it was supposed to be a test. A test that you already knew they were going to fail. So a lot of things you can bother put in place. You didn't, you didn't worry about keeping historical records because if you kept a record, then that record would validate that they were there. Failed or not. So why keep a record? They here today, gone tomorrow, three weeks from now, nobody remember you sitting next year. And unfortunately, they took the chair away. So that, that's how that happened. You had a question, sir. Yeah, um, and I'm just thinking about Marines were uh, fired, you know, at an aircraft. And I'm just thinking, how uh, hazardous is at the aircraft? I mean, the planes up here, you down here, they, you know. Well, no, that that was a less hazardous job. Okay, let me put it in perspective. Uh, that that house that's out at the monument right now, uh, they could fire around from here and take out Swanberg. So no, they were it was not close combat right. uh, with that particular weapon. They were they were doing some reaching out and touching. Now, uh, yeah, and they again they did the the guns, the, you know, the spotlights, and all of that. So those were were distance weapons. So, so, so you got to have to aim one of those weapons. You have to have some pretty good training in terms of uh, projection. Uh, it's a it's a um, uh, mathematics is a key component of that. So, where did they pick up all this training, the knowledge to fire and aim those things? Mount Point Camp Boot Camp. Okay. So, so who trained? Was the black this training? Or no, no, the regular drill instructors. Again, before they had black drill instructors, when they went to their training, like when they went to rifle range, yeah. the rifle range wasn't ran by blacks. They were still ran by whites. Right, right, right. So all of that training was still being provided by those Marines that was training from day one. Now, that particular gun that we're talking about, it took 22 Marines to operate that weapon. There was three of them. It had three seats on it. You actually sat on the gun. Uh, one individual handled elevation, the other one handled left and right, and you had one that loaded. Uh, and they, on an average, they could they could pump out like 22 rounds a minute out of that gun. And the rounds weighed 22 and a half pounds, each one of them. So uh, when you look at some of the pictures and you see all the marble pointers, you know, you can tell the guys they were gun loaded because they had the broad shoulders and, you know, the, the biceps to go with it. But yes, sir. Uh, and again, oddly enough, it was considered a portable weapon. But like I said, it took 22 Marines to pack it up, load it up, move it, get it where it needs to go, set it up, and be ready to fire. And, and they, they, yes, ma'am. And they became quite proficient at it. But again, like I said, they were never put into combat against any enemy aircraft. Uh, they spent a lot, most of their time holding ground has already been taken. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, any idea when the uh, Catagon thing is going, going to open back up? Uh, April 29th. Okay, great. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. I know that because we're working on it as I speak. Uh, and again, if you have not been before, uh, 
you owe it to yourself uh, to make a trip out there. If you have been, then we're here to tell you, you won't recognize the place when you go back. Uh, because the storm that blew in, you know, as, as bad as it was, out of bad things come good things. Uh, and we were able to get some renovations done that we never would have been able to do uh, had not the storm completely wiped everything out and we were able to do some, some major rebuilding with somebody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You said that one before the show exists. Uh, what type of schoolhouses do they still have over there? They offer the admin school, the finance. They still train some motor transport. <coughs> Corman School is still out there. Who did I forget? Okay, let me let me do this before I move any farther. Uh, we have with us uh, the individual who was the historian at Camp Johnson for a lot of years before he retired, which is Ron Bowler. And Ron can, can answer that question for you. Uh, they have uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Fort Tiberio, uh, the logistics, logistics school, which, was, which came down from Virginia and the supply school, and they also have the Sergeant Major's Academy or the Staff NCO Academy. I'm not sure which one they got out there now. Staff NCO. Yeah, okay. Uh, and they used to have an NCO school out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and again, it is still it is still a training facility. Uh, and when there was a lot of talk going around, when they were downsizing and closing bases, uh, Camp Johnson, Mocker Point, was never on the list uh, for closing. In, in consideration for closing. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hooper, and simply say, hey, uh, I hear you with my point, Marine, just call and say hi. Uh, 
some of you will get off quick, some of you won't. Depends <laughs> <laughs> on when you call. <laughs> yes, Ron. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. I doubt that. <laughs> when I first came here on the 23rd of October, 1983, I came from Fort Bragg. I was in the Army, but I was a civilian. Uh, <laughs> I was in the Army National Guard, then the Reserve. But one of my first jobs was given to me by uh, Lieutenant General, now Lieutenant General McKissick, was to establish a training program because he noticed that the young Marines who were coming to Moffett Point had no idea what Moffett Point was about. They didn't know any of the historical significance of it or anything like that. So I started doing a little stuff, and a little stuff became a lot of stuff. But this gentleman here, I met him when they first opened the, the museum. He was cutting paper for displays, and he took over that because I said, it's not my history, it's his history. And I, I thought he should do it. And I, ha I will tell you right now publicly, that man has done more for us because I publicly tell people, go over to the, to the, to the Lejeune Memorial Garden, the nicest uh, memorial over there is the Moffat Point Marine Museum uh, uh, Memorial. That's the man that did it. Uh, but now, to, to, catch, to piggyback on what Ron said, uh, he's, he's, he's absolutely correct about the historical piece. Uh, because I was the chief one of the two of the Marine Corps and knew nothing about Moffat Point. Had no idea that the history existed. And I had gone to Moffat Point uh, for school as a reservist. When, back when they had a two year enlistment, uh, did my two got out, joined the reserves, and then went to supply school at Moffat Point. And at that time, the sign at the, end, at the corner of 24 said Moffat Point, but had no idea about the history. So I was the chief one officer too during the Black History Month. Uh, Sergeant Major Huff had been invited to San Diego as a speaker. And we tasked 29 Palms with, uh, 29 Palms tasked us with doing something. We piggybacked off of them and brought Sergeant Major Hub 29 Palms. And that's when I learned there was such a thing called Mount Point. And I've been in the organization since. Okay, with that being said, uh, I'm being slapped. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to turn it back over to Kayla. And thank you all for coming.